Good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Start with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for your word and for all the promises that you give us. And we, as we investigate and study your word, Lord, we learn so much more about you. Thank you so much. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Okay, Genesis 8. I think we'll do the whole chapter. <clears throat> It's flooded subsiding, and uh, the, the Noadic Covenant begins. Uh, it's also known as the uh, <clears throat> dispensation of a human government. The human government is going to be set up. Human government, believe it or not, is ordained by God. Uh, and it's part of the reason that uh, in the beginning, they tried to set up a one, one leader type of a situation. That's not what God intended, that he ex expected countries and with borders and individual uh, governments that uh, led their their individual peoples. <clears throat> so let's get started and uh, put the verses up here. Okay, there's the verses and. <clears throat> And we've got a new picture today. It's kind of an interesting picture. Uh, particularly the top there. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, it's kind of like a, just a little reflection of the artist and what he's trying to, uh, some uh, behind the scenes stuff that we talked about already. I'll just hit those right off the bat. That. Uh, on the left there, kind of see a bit interesting uh, display there. I won't describe it since uh, sometimes uh, YouTube has issues with certain words. So I won't say anything about that picture you see, but that uh, uh, we know it has something to do with a uh, with that uh, thing that happened in Genesis 6.15, where the, uh, the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and bore children. Uh, and those children were, were uh, a... A hybrid or a transhuman of uh, uh, basically the DNA of of uh, Satan, I believe, and of humans. Then over on the right side, that one I can talk about. That's actually Esther. If you remember the story of Esther, uh, the next time that uh, this that Satan has his way and tries to eliminate the Jews after this time, where he tried to corrupt the seed. The next time is going to be the story of Esther and Haman and his plot to try to kill all the Jews. And if you remember correctly, that at the end, uh, uh, Haman himself ended up getting uh, hung on the gallows because uh, originally he was going to hang all the Jews that way. And so he used the very gallows that he was going to uh, hang the Jews on. And the king there, Axerxes, uh, Esther, had him hung on the same gallows, kind of like uh, uh, due punishment. And at the end, actually, all of his all of his children also. That was quite common then. And when a uh, when a, when somebody did something wrong in, in some of these worlds, uh, they would eliminate the whole family to make sure that uh, whatever thoughts the person uh, evil thoughts the person had that may have gone down into their children didn't uh, continue. So, uh, kind of an interesting way of handling uh, family issues, but. Uh, it was interesting to see, though, the artist, uh, you know, when I started thinking about some of these theories, it was way back when, before I started hearing about some of this stuff. And it's funny that the Lord has shown me at least a, oh, a dozen people that's, that they kind of think along the same lines I do of the interpretation of why the, the, the flood happened in the first place. And, and, and that Satan's going to do it again uh, in the future. I believe that has a lot to do with the uh, uh, time in the tribulation. Uh, we know as the mark of the beast. So let's continue on. I've actually got a section on that a little bit. I'm going to kind of uh, uh, talk about that again here in this, so I won't see much more right now. Let's start here in verse 1 of Genesis 8. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters uh, basically ass assuaged, uh, but uh, started to... Uh, to started to retract 
Well, time to get to work, recovering from the deluge, is why I, I look at this. Interesting words, God remembered Noah. I don't believe it's an indi indication God ever forgot him, but it's time to turn his attention back to Noah. I can imagine, just like other times in history, that God was forced to do something he did not take pleasure in. I think, and I, when I read this passage, it reminded me, and I don't know why, uh, sometimes uh, when I think about passages, it could be something I heard or something else I was reading, but for some reason, uh, what came to mind is a passage in uh, Revelation 8. <clears throat> Actually, Revelation 6. And I can just imagine all the times in history that God was forced to do something he did not take pleasure in. I think about a passage in Revelation where I believe God, again, must punish mankind and takes no pleasure in it. It's in a pause between the 6th and 7th uh, seal judgment. So let's take a look over here in Revelation 6, 12. Now, Gehel, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. <clears throat> and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as fig trees, fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of the mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That's, that's the... And what's going to happen next is in between the two, uh, in between the sixth and seventh seal. I believe he's talking about the midway point of the tribulation, and now God's wrath will be poured out due to the Antichrist desecrating his holy temple. Uh, so let's just look at, at a few verses of this coming day when God again has to judge the world for a final time. So we see in a note in chapter 11, verse 13, in the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in an earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and a remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God of heaven. What this earthquake may look like, we get here a glimpse of another passage. Jesus warns those in Judea to flee for their lives. I just realized though I didn't ever I never showed you that uh, verse I wanted to show you. I didn't put it in here. Let me get that real quick. It's in Revelation eight. Uh, eight, one. This is what I was thinking of: is that uh, God was uh, was not looking forward to what He had to do, and uh, this is the verse that I was uh, thinking about when I started on this uh, idea. And when He had opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. And I think it's just it's just God kind of contemplating what He has to do, and it. Uh, it it really bothered him uh, to have to do what he's going to have to do during the tribulation. And so I was thinking about that when I was thinking about this, when Noah remembered uh, Noah. And just to finish on my thought process here. Uh, got a glimpse of another passage. Jesus warns those in Judea to flee for their lives. And that's in Matthew 24. I know I originally put these verses in here. Okay. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, where the reader this, uh, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let them which be in the housetops not come down to take anything out of their houses. Now let them that which is in the field turn, return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. But then shall be great tribulation, such as it was not since the beginning of the world, to this time nor ever shall be. And except those days shall be shortened, there shall be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. 
That was from Joel 2, 10, 11. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their sign shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp are very great. But he is strong that he executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? He's all talking about God's wrath that he's going to spiel out. And I believe that's why the silence. Uh, well, first we had the, uh, the whole thing there where uh, the abomination of desolation. And basically, the Antichrist is going to go into the temple, God's holy place, and, do, and desecrate it. With a, he's going to offer an unclean animal. That's probably why I thought of this, too, is that uh, Noah did have some unclean animals. But here he's sacrificing uh, properly, and he's doing it in a proper way. And I probably, that's probably what made me think about it. Joel 2, 31 and 32. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So when this happens, basically, uh, Jesus told them that uh, just leave town quickly. And this is when I think God is going to send a... Uh, an earthquake and a volcano and a bunch of other stuff that's going to cause all those things that we talked about to happen. And it uh, basically, he's going to uh, go into full stare attack against the Antichrist uh, and against the people that are following him. And so uh, just prior to that is when I think that half hour is. Just one more thing in Daniel 9.27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. This is the, this is the uh, prophecy of that prophecy. For the overspring of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So that basically, uh, that was Daniel telling us this is going to happen in, in the future. And of course, this happens... Uh, Actually, in uh, Revelation 12, 6 through 10. So let me just read through that. And then we'll get back to what we were talking about. And the woman fled, the woman in this case is Israel, fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that she should be fed here, there, a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's the last three and a half years of the tribulation. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. And they prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I believe that uh, that verse there and that I was mentioning over there in uh, uh, Revelation 6, was that scene? I said the stars fall from heaven. Stars are, are symbolic of angels, in this case, fallen angels. And the reason that the 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 the, uh, the uh, sun and the, and, the, and the stars was darkened uh, was because volcanoes, when they blow off, they put up a bunch of ash, and you can't see the sky. It gets so dark. So I think that's a really good description of the midway point. And that's why I picked it. Revelation 12, 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. And jump into verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandment of God, had the testimony of Jesus Christ. So that those that did not flee into what I believe is Petra will be persecuted heavily by uh, Satan uh, and his minions. And there'll be a lot of other things happening at this time. Uh, depending on what you guys want to do after we get done uh, with this study, uh, we may even go through to do some more revelation stuff. But uh, that's my little prophecy moment for today. So we will get back into uh, uh, Genesis. So talking about... <coughs> <clears throat> where we left off in Genesis 1.1. Uh, let, me, let me just 
read it again. Uh, Genesis 8, 1. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the water uh, re rescinded. So we also see in the time of Abraham how God remembers the righteousness of Abraham. And that's, uh, we'll see that when we get to Genesis 19, 29. But here's a, uh, another example of God remembering. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that's Sodom and Gomorrah, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrown, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. That was due to an agreement that uh, God had given to Abraham about protecting anyone who is righteous in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's what he meant by God remembered Abraham. So I was kind of tar uh, seeing the two where when, when God said uh, he remembered Noah, he remembered his obligation to Noah. Uh, and so I'm trying to show that instead of, not that he, did, he forgot Noah, but that uh, he actually uh, remembered, uh, he was remembering the, the, uh, the covenant that he was going to make with Noah over this. So 8.2. And the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested on the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month, in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. And it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. So forty days again, and we looked at this uh, list yesterday, but here's one I missed uh, over in Genesis 50, verse 2 and 3. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. Israel was another name for Isaac, I mean Jacob. And 40 days were fulfilled for him, for so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. Another use of 40. Uh, and that's another period of time where uh, uh, things were really good, but it was just before the uh, enslavement of the uh, Jewish nation in Egypt. Okay, verse 8, 7. So Noah sent forth, and he sent forth a raven, which went forth, forth to and fro upon the waters were dried up from off the earth. Interesting thing about a raven. A raven is a, uh, a, a bird of uh, prey. Uh, he's like, uh, they're like vultures where they go after dead things. I kind of think it's interesting that uh, this raven never came back. This is kind of symbolic of, the, of a of something drawn to the world. Uh, interesting that the raven never returned. We see this as a symbol of being drawn to the world. As a raven is an unclean bird. Uh, we see this over in Deuteronomy 14, 12 through 14. But these are they of which ye shall not eat, the eagle and the ostrich and the osprey, and the gleed and the kite and the vulture, any after his kind, and every raven after his kind. So it's an unclean bird. It's because they're, uh, I get that word, it's, uh, uh, it means they eat uh, dead animals. But the reason that the uh, raven never came back is you can imagine that uh, floating on the water and, 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 and all around the earth were lots of uh, bodies uh, of uh, animals and humans. And so the raven was like, uh, like had plenty to eat and uh, he had no desire to go back to the ark. And I kind of see that symbolically that uh, he was drawn to the world and what the world offered, uh, but that uh, he had totally forgot his mission and did not go back to the righteous Noah uh, to report back of what he knew. I thought that was uh, a great message in that as, as we are drawn to worldly pleasures of abundance, we forget God and never return. Just throw that little uh, uh, sermonette in there. Okay, Genesis 8, 8. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated off of the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for her soul, for her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark. See, the, 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 the dove had no interest in all those bodies out there. Uh, of course, it, they pro she probably could have landed on, on a body that was disgusting to her, probably. I'm just thinking out loud. 
returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. Kind of almost symbolic of God reaching out and uh, and uh, bring us uh, bringing him to us. We're going to see some symbology here with the dove, because the next time the dove comes back, it's with the olive branch. And they call that the peace offering. If you ever seen that, you've probably seen that symbol of an of a dove with an olive branch, which stands for peace. Okay, verse 10. And he stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So no one knew that the uh, water was abated from off the earth. Obviously, the, uh, the, the, uh, the dove found some vegetation uh, that was edible. But there are, lots of people see that symbolically as peace. So that now that, uh, uh, that peace has been achieved, uh, it's kind of like the symbology there. And based on the fact that uh, the dove had a mission, it did not stay away. It came back to report to Noah. Uh, that's another thing that that did. Uh, once you once you're in God's pleasure, and yet you're uh, you have a desire to be uh, to come back to the righteous. Verse twelve, <clears throat> and he stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. So you can see now that the dove uh, had. Uh, uh, it basically shows that the that the, uh, the water was abated, and it uh, it showed Noah that it's time to get to work. So that uh, this is a symbolic that it's time for Noah to leave the ark. Also, so verse thirteen and fourteen. And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering off the ark and looked and beheld the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. Well, interesting enough, this kind of shows us, uh, I showed this, I pointed this out yesterday, but this shows us exactly how long Noah was in the ark. And it was one full solar year, but plus the calendar changes. It's interesting how it shows us in the verses. Uh, let me show you something here. So when we go back to uh, verse 711. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So you see that 600 year and the second month, 17th day of the month. Now we jump to verse 815. Oh, the, and then we go back to uh, uh, 13, I mean. Oh no, I'm, I'm gonna get, I gotta get to it just a minute. And God spoke unto Noah saying, Go forth out of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and their sons' wives. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creepy thing, and creepeth upon the earth. I'm not supposed to be here yet. Wait a minute. Oh, I'm supposed to go back to verse 13. So we had the 600th year. Then you come to verse uh, 13 here, and it says the 601st year. So the full year, and the first month, though, it's not the second month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, behold, the faces was dry. So it isn't quite uh, a year yet. But Noah also hasn't left the ark yet. He just uncovered it. But when we go to verse 14, in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And that's when Noah, so now we're in the second month, the 27th day. So it's 10 days later than uh, the, a year ago when he left. And that's the difference between the lunar and the solar way of calculating uh, a year. Uh, the lunar way actually comes out to uh, a month is 29 and a half days, where you uh, a solar year, the month is 30 days long. So at this point, now Noah is looking at a 30-day month. So I'd point that out. It was something that was pointed out in my Bible. I thought it was kind of interesting. Okay, on to verse 15. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. 
Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with me. Why did you keep the same verse again? Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of the all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. They may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. Here starts the next dispensation of uh, human government. Beginning here with Noah starting to repopulate the earth. So he had, he had his marching orders and he was going to actually be in charge uh, of everything. Uh, and he's the, he's the, uh, the leader of the uh, the whole earth uh, at this point, kind of. Uh, so that's why they call it the beginning of human government. Some other verses on this that can reflect back to Genesis one twenty two, when also the same order was given to Adam, and God blessed him, saying, "Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth." That's what he, uh, God gave the same order to the to the animals then too. And also Psalms 121.8. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Okay, going back to Genesis 8.18. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him. It sure says that a lot. Every beast, every creepy thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And, the, and Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took a, every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered a burnt offerings unto the Lord. So here we see that definitely the Lord is not forgetting uh, who safely got to him to this point. Realize that God just finished killing the entire planet. There's some estimates that think that it could have been as much as three or four billion people on the planet at this time. And the Lord smelt the sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. So this begins uh, <coughs> the third dispensation, human government. Uh, it's under conscience, as in innocence, man utterly failed. And the judgment of the flood marks the end of the second dispensation and the beginning of the third. The declaration of the Noahic covenant sub subjects humanity to a new test. This distinctive feature is the institution for the first time of human government, the government of man by man. The highest function of government is judicial taking of life. All other governmental powers are implied in that. Uh, it follows that the third dispensation is distinctively that of human government. Man is responsible to govern the world for God. That responsibility rested upon the whole race, Jew and Gentile, until the failure of Israel under the Palestinian covenant. And we'll get, that'll be the next one. It's in Deuteronomy 28.1. So we, from here, to, from Genesis to Deuteronomy, uh, will be in the uh, nomadic covenant. And it shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. So he brought the, brought the judgment of the captive in the times of the Gentiles. Uh, and so this, this begins also the times uh, of the Gentiles uh, passed exclusively into, so we see that in Luke 21, 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So once we get into the Palestinian covenant, that's when the Gentiles are actually going to be taken over. You also see this in Daniel uh, 2, uh, 36, with the statue, and Nebuchadnezzar's statue. That, uh, and so this is, this is a, so this would be uh, basically starting in about 600 BC. So from now, which is about uh, 2400 BC, until, because uh, the next one actually starts at the uh, Tower of Babel, I believe. 
And that's what we're just reading there in Deuteronomy. And that's when the Palestinian uh, covenant will start. And that's where uh, basically God separates everybody into their own. In other words, he tried to get people to separate their own governments from now until then, but they didn't do it. So then he's, so God's going to force them into it by confusing their languages. So they're going to fail again, in other words. And so that uh, under the, uh, after that covenant, they brought the judgment of the captivities when the times of the Gentiles. And that's talked about what we just read there in, uh, in Luke. Began the government of the world passed exclusively into Gentile hands. And that's, and that's in Daniel 2.36. So basically, the uh, uh, the uh, Abrahamic covenant will be another one uh, was taken away from them because of the, uh, the wanderings in the desert and the fact that they didn't go into the uh, promised land. We'll get into all that when we get to it. I'm not going to try to explain it all here. But that uh, the times of the Gentiles uh, will begin. And that's in Daniel 2, 36 through 45. Now, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And whosoever the children of the men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. This is thy head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh into pieces, and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as they saw as iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were a part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with mire of the clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces, consume all these kingdoms, and it will stand forever. For as much as thou sawest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron and the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation there is sure of. So we, we've talked about that particular dream before, and that's basically the four Gentile governments that are going to be in power, and they're in power even now. Uh, they're mostly Gentiles, uh, and that's still happening now uh, that, the, uh, that the, uh, the land of Israel is no longer in the control of, uh, of, uh, the, uh, the, of the Jewish nation. And that's going to happen until that ends during the tribulation itself. So as they sh shall fall by the edge of the sword, back to Luke 21-24, 24, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That was Jesus talking to Luke. That basically is going to happen after this period of time. Uh, but that, uh, this particular reading I got out of uh, out of my Schofield Reference Bible. It's kind of like a breakdown of, uh, of this third dispensation. And he gets one more verse, a couple of verses here that uh, talk about it in Acts 15, 14 through 17. Simeon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this degree, the words of the prophets as it was written. And after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residual of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Just another passage that talks about uh, this period of time of the Gentiles. Then both Israel and the Gentiles have, have governed for self, not God, is sadly apparent. The judgment of confusion of tongues ending in the racial testing that of the captives of Jewish, while the Gentile testing will end in the smiting of the image in Daniel 2. 
The judgment of the nations uh, is in Matthew 24, 31 through 46. That's the sheep and goat judgment. And that's at the end of the uh, uh, at the end of the tribulation. I won't read that. It's pretty long. And we're already getting to the end here. So that's basically the dispensation and a kind of a breakdown of the next couple of dispensations. But this one, next one is human government. And those are, and those are the different human governments that are going to be in play uh, between now uh, and uh, basically until Jesus returns. So back to Genesis 8.22. This is the end of the chapter. While the earth remains as seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. That was a fascinating verse uh, when I started researching it. Uh, while the earth remained as he, uh, in the Hebrew as yet all the days of the earth. Uh, check out Isaiah 54, 8. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. So even though he's you know he's going to he brought judgment on the earth that he's going to remember his people. In the end, and it talks about seed time and harvest. Pretty interesting thing that I never really knew before. So I threw in here is that uh, we as uh, uh, from European descent to, to think of uh, four seasons: summer, spring, winter, and fall. But actually, I never realized that uh, in the Middle East, they actually have six seasons. And, it's, and we saw them here in this verse. And so if you look closely, while the earth remaineth, seed time, harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter. Six of them. Day and day and night, not, uh, day and night are not seasons, shall not cease. And it's interesting that that is, uh, that is still true to this day. But there are six divisions in the text which obtain in Palestine among the Hebrews and exist among the Arabs to this present day. According to the gracious promise, the heavenly bodies have preserved their courses, the seasons, their successions, and the earth its increase for the use of man. So some references to this over in Exodus 34, 21. Six days thou shalt work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest. In an earing time and in harvest thou shalt rest. Psalm 74, 16 and 17. The day is thine, the night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Notice it says the, the day, uh, I mean, uh, the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. And going over to uh, Song of Solomon 2, 11 and 12. Lo, the winter is past and the rain is go over and gone. And the flowers appear on the earth and the time of the singing of the birds is come. And the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. And last but not least, over in Isaiah 54, 9. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn un that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. Uh, so it's basically a promise that God will not destroy the earth ever again. I thought that was kind of neat, that uh, idea that there's actually six seasons uh, celebrated in the Middle East. So that's what I have for today. And uh, that finishes chapter 8. A little side note there uh, into uh, Revelation, uh, which I find fascinating uh, study uh, because of uh, uh, it's, good, it's right around the corner. Even though we won't be here, I think it's important to study and to and to and to keep our forefront in our minds uh, because it, uh, as we're witnessing to people, it's probably important to, to point out uh, what the future holds. And I know. Uh, it, that it's a lot better now to, to uh, seek the Lord while you still can, as they say. Because uh, uh, once that rapture happens and they go deep into the tribulation, it's not going to be a fun time. So let's end with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you so much for the promises you give us. And the warnings also, Lord, that uh, uh, to, to, to keep out of your wrath, it's best to look, uh, look to you now and to seek your guidance and your love. And to, and to become a uh, come into your family now rather than later. And we give you praise and thanks. And may we all be uh, ever uh, joyful when, uh, when one more sinner repents. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. It's true that they celebrate in heaven every time a uh, new believer repents. So uh, 
important words to remember. So I will talk, we'll talk again tomorrow. We'll head into chapter nine. Have a good day.